All right. All right, welcome to the DDPA seminar, everyone. Uh, before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. First of all, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. If you have questions, you're welcome to unmute and ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's DDPS seminar is open to uh, external audiences. Um, so no classified discussion is allowed. Uh, finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. That's about it. Now let me introduce our speaker today. It is an honor to host Hassam uh, Babai, who is currently an uh, assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science at the University of Pittsburgh. He earned his PhD in Mechanical Engineering and math <clears throat> Master's in Applied Mathematics, both from Louisiana State University in 2013. He then joined the Mechanical Engineering Department at MIT for his postdoctoral research, where he worked with uh, Professor George Kanyadakis. He joined the University of Pittsburgh in January 2017. <coughs> His research is focused on developing reduced to the model and machine learning techniques for science and engineering problems. His research has been funded by many organizations, including NASA, NSF, and NIH, and the Air Force of Scientific Research. Today, uh, Hassam will talk about uh, Kerr matrix decomposition for scalable reduced order modeling of nonlinear partial differential equations using time dependent basis. Please enjoy and expect a wonderful talk. Now, without further ado, let me pass the button to Hassan by asking one random question. Today's random question is What is your um, idea of the perfect day? What defines your perfect day? <laughs> okay, perfect day would be a sunny day <laughs> by the beach with my family. Oh, nice. Right now in California, it's not a perfect day. <laughs> Neither is, is here. <laughs> okay, yes. the stage is yours. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you so much, Yangsu, for the invitation and your kind introduction. Uh, so, I, as you said, I have been working on, on developing reduced order modeling based on time dependent basis. So, to just motivate that, uh, and uh, so let me uh, play this animation. What you see on the left is a biologically reacting flow. Uh, these are, you're seeing this uh, species mass fraction of 23 species here. And in order to solve this equation, you have to solve basically a system of PD of 23 equations. And uh, so uh, you can have larger mechanisms and you can go up to uh, order of a thousand species, which I cannot show here. Obviously solving this system of PDEs is computationally expensive, both in terms of memory, uh, IO, and also flops, CPU cost, right? So a floating point operation cost. So, but as you, as you so let me play that again. You can see a, there is a lot of uh, similarities or, as we say, correlations between these different species instantaneously. And what I want to show you that you can use time dependent basis to both extract and also exploit these structures to uh, reduce the computational cost of these, uh, these, uh, eco uh, these uh, simulations, both in terms of memory and storage and uh, what I want to talk about, which is the, fo uh, the, the, the focus of the talk, uh, is the COR decomposition, which I, I can show you that that kind of decomposition can uh, improve the flops cost. So uh, without further ado, let me just go. So these are, uh, these are all of my students and collaborators. These are the ones who actually contributed uh, to some extent to this talk. So I have my postdocs, former postdocs and students, and also my collaborators, Dr. Peyman Gibby at University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Jackie Chen at Sandia, Dr. Mark Carpenter at NASA Langley, and also Professor David Fernandez at the University of Waterloo. All right, so this is an outline of my talks. So I'll, I'll, I'll just introduce this time-dependent basis. Uh, I'll talk about some of the previous stuff that we did and uh, application of time-dependent basis to competing sensitivities and also turbulent combustion. Then I'll talk about this uh, COR factorization and how that can be used um, to speed up uh, computation using this time-dependent basis. And I'll talk about some applications to unsettled quantification. 
So let me just give you a brief overview of, of on the fly low rank approximation using time dependent basis. Really, the motivation is solving high dimensional PDs. Even in the when I say high dimensional, in, if you discretize that system, the discrete vector has a very large number, order of millions to billions. Uh, and so the way we solve this system of equations using traditional scientific computing techniques, we use this um, basis, we use them, we choose them from classical techniques. It could be Fourier uh, methods, could be polynomial methods, polynomial, uh, uh, spectral polynomials, uh, so on and so forth. Well, we make a choice here and then we do separation of values. This is like a traditional way of doing scientific computing. And actually that choice is, is the core, is the root of the problems, especially if you go to high dimensions, where the uh, these bases, because they do not uh, ex, um, exploit correlations, the, then the computation resulting from this kind of discretization suffers from the cares of dimensionality, meaning this n uh, scales uh, exponentially large with the number of dimensions. So there are a number of ways to, to tackle this. So one way is to do data driven. So let's gather data from these, uh, observe these systems and then do some sort of dimension reduction. Um, um, uh, you can do autoencoder, uh, you can do POD, DMD, all kinds of uh, um, um, dimension reduction techniques and then do some sort of projection. So this is a, a typical way of, uh, of, of solving this kind of problem. Uh, but whenever we do any kind of data-driven um, uh, dimension reduction, um, there is no guarantee that whenever we build that subspace uh, or, or, or manifold, that um, um, that manifold can extrapolate to, to unseen data, right? So you always have that problem. And also you have the issue of actually having to solve that system full or more. Right, so it's for some of these applications, we can't even solve that full normal at once, let alone generating data. Right, so uh, and, and like I said, collectively, um, these are the challenges of, of, of adopting a data-driven type methodologies for, for these massive systems. So I'm talking about like focal plane type equation, for example, where just solving this once could be, could be out of uh, question. So the idea is to one way, one remedy is that uh, that I've been focusing on is actually to don't choose these spaces. Let the governing equation find these spaces for you in a way that exploits correlation, right? So this is the whole idea of of of, of time dependent basis. The in an abstract way that we don't choose this from a classical library. We actually let the governing equation to find it, and I'll show you how you can do that for different problems. Okay. So the idea, if I want to go back to the uh, challenges of data driven reduce modeling is that can be bypassed the data generation and just directly for, solve for these for these equations, right? There are there is a way to actually make these time dependent bases also data driven. I'm not talking about those uh, those uh, uh, problems today. I'm focusing on the ones that actually we don't want to do data generation. We want to directly solve the PDE. So if you think about it, we just want to solve the PDE by exploiting the structure correlated structures in the PD. And, and once we do that, we can actually build that reduce or more on the fly. So this is like a, uh, an overview of reduce or more with time dependent basis. The, the very, very important distinction between this and like POD type decomposition is that this is a, applied to matrix differential equations. So you must have a matrix, you have to formulate your problem as a matrix differential equation. And you can extend that to also tensor differential equation. Let's say this is a matrix differential equation where phi is not a vector, it's actually a matrix. So here I'm showing a, a, a schematic of that. Let's imagine this V is this matrix and it has many, many columns. You can think of application of this as a UQ application where each column is, is a random sample of the, of the dynamical system. And if these, this matrix is, is instantaneously low rank, you can approximate it with an SVD like uh, approximation. This is just one scheme. I, I take this as an example. And if this is instantaneously low rank, you can um, reduce NS to R and hopefully R, if, if this is a low rank matrix, R is much smaller than N. Uh, and then uh, basically this is an SVD-like decomposition um, within the time dependent uh, reduce or modeling formulation, you can actually derive evolution equation for all these three components without actually uh, 
needing to generate data. And these are based on, uh, if you want to know the background math behind this is actually beautiful Riemannian optimization, uh, where these, the rank R matrices, uh, you can show that rank R matrix relies, the space of rank R matrices relies on this is smooth uh, manifold. And then you can use that, uh, the Riemannian optimization uh, mm, uh, tools to to do projection on that manifold, find the tangent space, and evolve that tangent space. So all of the math part that I, I'm not going to cover today is actually in, uh, covered within the Riemannian optimization. But what's important is that, like I said, there is no data required here, other than the initial condition and boundary condition. So uh, uh, yes, that's data, but not observation of the physical system, right? So and then you can derive evolution equation for for these matrices. And because there is no data involved, right? So you this kind of low rank approximation doesn't even have the issue of extrapolating to unseen data because there is no data involved in the whole workflow process. So all adapt to the changing conditions. And one and one of the nice thing about this kind of decomposition is that the system could be very high rank over time, but needs to be low rank instantaneously. So that's the key observation. If the system is very high rank instantaneously, this is not an efficient methodology. All right, so because of connection to SVD, and I'll show you actually, this is very closely related to instantaneous SVD of that matrix, and closely approximates that without actually computing any SVD, then that's the key. Uh, it's quite interpretable, right? We know how to interpret an SVD dimension reduction. Uh, just some, some notes, actually this was originated in quantum chemistry community for solving Schrodinger equation. And so this goes back actually in, in the year 2000, there is this beautiful review paper, uh, which shows how this kind of methodology, which you, you uh, decompose your matrix to three uh, SVD-like matrices, um, you can solve, you can use that for, for solving Schrodinger equation. Then in this paper, this was uh, put into a more general context, right? So this is exactly the same formulation here, but just put into more general context. And this is now called dynamical low rank approximation. Uh, and 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 but, uh, sort of on, on a parallel universe, uh, another sort of decomposition, which is a, a, a two matrix decomposition, was also developed. First, we know is by Temis, Sapsis, and Lemajou at MIT. They developed dynamically orthogonal decomposition, and and later on, uh, George Konidarkis and Temis Sapsis also worked together on on this kind of methodology, and also myself. And there was another version of this, again, a two matrix decomposition, by orthonormal decomposition. It was shown that DO and BO are exactly the same thing. There is also a two, um, two matrix decomposition, optimally time-dependent decomposition that is applied to linear systems, uh, which I worked with. Uh, I worked on that. Uh, and also there is a dynamically orthogonal, dually dynamically orthogonal decomposition. Sorry, there's a typo here. What is so this? All of these terminologies may sound confusing, but I want to show you that they, all of these are actually equivalent to each other, right? So actually, we show that in, in this paper that you can um, that this dynamical low rank approximation, these triple matrices are actually uh, is like a hybrid of DO and BO together, and they are equivalent. What do I mean by equivalent? They are exactly the same low rank matrix approximation of the full matrix. And so, so as you see throughout this talk, I use uh, this or, or this, but you shouldn't get distracted by any of these triple matrix decomposition or, or two, two matrix decomposition. What is important to know is that they all follow the same principle and they are equivalent. Okay, let me show you an example of that before I get to the COR decomposition for computing sensitivities, how you can use this kind of uh, Mm, this is an application of, of doing reduced order modeling based on time dependent basis. So this is applied to compute sensitivities of, 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 of high dimensional systems, right? So if you want to compute sensitivities of a high dimensional system, let's say this is a nonlinear dynamical system, and you want to perturb this with respect to some so, sort of parameters, for each of those parameters, you would have to solve this linear sensitivity equation, right? So uh, obviously, if the number of parameters is large, this is not a cost effective way. That's why people use adjoint equation. For adjoint equation, you only solve one equation backward in time. So you have to solve the forward equation and then solve one equation backward in time and, and then compute sensitivities for a given objective function with respect to all the parameters. But there is like two 
major problems with that join. One is actually I/O because you have to store the full forward model, uh, and then and then um, um, to solve the adjoint equation backward in time. So that I/O is actually a a major problem, especially for massive simulations like uh, turbulent combustion problems, where you can't store the forward solution at all in a time resolved manner. Um, and, and also, adjoint, you have to derive adjoint for any any given parameter, uh, for any given objective function. So if your objective function changes, you have to do another adjoint equation. But so, the, so now let's look at it from a, a, a completely different perspective. And that is that uh, these sensitivities, so if you look at these sensitivities, these are actually different sensitivities with respect to different parameters. They are correlated to each other instantaneously. If they are correlated, you, you don't need to solve for each one of those, and you can actually solve for a compressed version of those forward in time, right? So that's really the key observation here. And so if you look at this, this is, again, you have a matrix differential equation. So you can look at the sensitivity equation as a matrix differential equation where you are evolving all of these sensitivities together. And like I said, if these are low rank, you can, you can compress them. So this is this work that was published last year in SIAM. Uh, and this is, I, I'm using the the by decomposition here, but like I said, you can actually derive a triple decomposition here. Uh, so instead of solving for all of these sensitivities, solve for only a rank R, with hopefully R is much smaller than D, solve for D. So you need to solve PDE. So this is not cheap to solve either, but at least you solve PDEs of order R instead of D. And then uh, these are really projections of the fuller model onto these bases, and this is you get the, these coefficients by raw. This approximation, if this matrix is instantaneously low rank, it's a good approximation, and and, and that's it. So the way we swap, we um, find the evolution equation for u and y is by forming a variational principle. This variational principle is nothing but the residual that you get because we are doing a low rank approximation. So instead of the whole matrix of sensitivity, we put U Y transpose in the full order model. And because it's a low rank approximation, this is not going to be zero, but this is going to be some non-zero. We want to minimize this by optimally updating the low rank basis U and, and the coefficient. Subject to this orthonormative condition, we want this uh, um, basis to be orthonormal. You can actually solve this with Lagrange multiplier once you solve this equation, you get this closed form evolution equation for these bases and the coefficients. And then you solve this instead of solving this equation. And that's where you get the computational advantage, right? Instead of solving for D fields, you solve for R fields. And, and D over R is what you get in terms of memory saving and also in terms of, in terms of flops uh, uh, saving. So this is now we apply this to uh, uh, the same problem was showing you at the very first slide. This is the biochemical reactions, uh, biological reactions. So uh, these uh, these are reaction parameters, and it's very important to know how the, any quantity of interest is sensitive to any of these parameters because the, computing these, measuring these quantities is very expensive, um, and you you can't afford to measure all of them super accurately, you have to do a budget allocation and say, okay, these 10 parameters are important and which are those 10 parameters. There are other applications as well, but this is just one. A skeletal model reduction is another one. So you can actually drop these reactions if they're not important, if they're not, if, they, if nothing is sensitive with respect to those and actually come up with a reduced uh, mechanism. So if you look at this, uh, this is actually a tensor because you've got like here 23 species and we have 34 reaction parameters. If you look at the entire matrix, the entire sensitivity is actually a tensor. Uh, you have parameters, you have a species here, and then you have grid points. But so here, what we do, we flatten this tensor and then it becomes a matrix. So these are the uh, sensitivities of different species with respect to different parameters. And then we seek to approximate this with this low rank approximation. So instead of solving 23 by 34, PDEs, which, which would be forward sensitivity equations, or if you want to solve adjoint equation, you have to solve an adjoint equation for each of these species. So, or instead of solving 23 adjoint equation, we want to do a low rank approximation of this and see what we get. Now, and we did that. So this particular formulation is called force optimal time dependent decomposition or FOTD. Um, 
like I said, it's a particular variation of that time dependent basis, just applied to linear sensitivity equation. And you can see uh, with increasing rank from two to eight, you can, this is relative error. You can actually match, uh, you can reduce the error significantly. Uh, like I said, this is with, with five mods, you can get less than 1% error, relative error. And this, what we optimal, we show, we actually took, we solved the full order model, all of the sensitivities, and we took instantaneous SVD of that. That would be the best and lowest error that one could achieve. And we see actually we are tracking the instantaneous SVD very well. Like I said, we, when we solve these equations, we do not take any SVD. This is all evolution equation, but the evolution equation is such that it approximates the instantaneous SVD. And you can see here the singular values match with the S instantaneous SVD. So that means we are actually very, very closely tracking the optimal subspace here. And with five modes, basically it's equivalent, the cost of solving for five modes is equivalent of solving five PDEs for five sensitivities as opposed to 782. And also memory storage is also the same. We solve, basically we only need to store five modes. The coefficients, those are, in terms of storing that, that those are negligible. And so, but you can visualize the model. Hey, Hassan, I, can yeah. you go back to the previous slide? I, I, I don't usually stop the presentation, but I had to because I'm, I'm sure. missing something. So you're, so you're solving five PDEs instead of 782. So, so from those five PDEs, you generate the data. And I mean, but you said that you're not using the data to construct this evolutionary equations. That's right. I'm, That's I'm, right. I'm missing something. How yeah. do you actually construct the so, evolution? You solve five PDs for five of these modes, and also you solve an ODE for the evolution equation. Anytime you want, you can reconstruct the full order of sensitivities. And oh, approximate. you simply just matrix. Matrix. Okay. So you saw for these two matrices, as I shown here, five PDs here, the cost of this is really negligible compared yeah. to this. Yeah. So five PDs and ODE, which this is a ROM basically, but ROM is a instantaneous projection of your full or more onto this basis. Uh, and, and based on that, you can, re, uh, you can multiply these two skinny matrices and reconstruct the uh, full sensitivities anytime you want. But we don't do that. I mean, but you can do that at any, any point you want. And, and where the where the parameter comes in, um, so, I so parameters are the forcing. They show up at forcing in the sensitivity equation, right? So when you take the linear sensitivity, you take the derivative of of your full or more with respect to these parameters. They show up as forcing in the right hand side of the, and so you see F shows up in all of these equations. Okay, Hassan. Sure. Okay, and also the, this actually uh, be all of the details you can find in this paper if, if you are interested. And so let me go back to this slide. So you can see actually the modes here. Like I said, this is interpretable. The modes actually capture the structure. So this is the first mode, the second mode, and third mode. You see actually captures finer and finer structures. So these are a time dependent subspace that is evolving with your system. And like this is a convection dominated problem. So you cannot solve these problems with POD with a static basis. You have to resort to some sort of basis adaptivity. And I know Yang Su and also others actually have worked on adaptive basis, but this is a matrix differential equation. So I think that's really the, the difference here, not a vector evolution equation. And also Benjamin Pestrofer and Karthik also at the University of Michigan also have worked on adaptive basis. But, uh, but this is, like I said, this is a matrix differential equation. Anyway, so you, once you solve this problem, you can actually take your y1 and, and reconfigure that because this, we, we, remember this was a tensor, we flattened that. And then you can actually see the sensitivities with respect to, uh, of all the species with respect to all 34 parameters. This is just one of the modes, y1, just visualize here. And you can see uh, which parameters is affecting which species immediately. Like I said, this, is, uh, uh, this actually has that simplified data representation that is immediately, um, um, uh, um, it's explainable, interpretable. So I want to talk about uh, application turbulent combustion. Uh, this is another application where you have a matrix differential equation. Let's uh, look at that. So turbulent combustion, you have to solve this compressible Navier-Stokes equation. I'm taking DNS here, but this could be RANS or LES. But then yeah, you need to solve this species transport equation. And for complex views, you may have even order of a thousand species. So this is Solving this equation is really the major cost of solving turbulent combustion because you have to first store this 1000 species, which is really just out of question for on the DNS grid. Just storing a matrix with 1000 species is out of question. And that is really the main bottleneck. 
and also the IO cost. Like this is actually this is from 2012 from Dr. Jackie Chen's group that uh, simulate. This is a direct quote from the paper that uh, because of IO limitation, can, we can only store like for every 400 time a step of the solution. This is three dimensional simulation, whereas there are things happening or the order of 10 simulation time steps that are completely missed if you store the data every 400 time steps. So this is just IO, so you can imagine the memory and, and solving this system. And this is not for a 1000 species, I think this is order of 100 species. So if as we push this uh, boundary to exascale computing, and especially when memory and IO are the main issues, actually solving this equation is, is a major challenge. And so how, but if you look at this equation, this is a matrix differential equation, a nonlinear matrix differential equation. And again, now here I'm using the triple decomposition, but like I said, you shouldn't get distracted by two decompo by decomposition or triple decomposition, they are equivalent. So then you have this uh, matrix decomposition, you can write this, so you this is a full order model evolution equation, Again, you can follow the same uh, principle, which is a residual minimization. Plug in this kind of low rank approximation, and this is a low rank approximation, so you've got some error here, and plug it in here. Because it's a low rank approximation, it's not gonna satisfy the full order model. So you get this residual, and you wanna minimize that residual by optimally updating all three components. Once you solve this minimization problem, subject to the orthonormality of U modes and Y modes, then you get evolution equation here, you can find the details here in this paper, but just suffice to say that we are solving this, uh, and solving this doesn't require some optimiz some iteration or anything. You get evolution equation as the optimality condition. So the evolution equations are the optimality condition. So you don't need to solve a nonlinear optimization problem and so on and so forth. This, these are the optimality conditions. Uh, so it's not like that you actually solve a gradient base. So these are actually what minimizes. If you if you and sigma and y satisfy this governing equation, you are minimizing this residual. And so we apply this to uh, different fuels. I'll just show you a sample of this. This is a two-dimensional flow. Uh, uh, this is GRI mechanism. Actually has quite complex chemistry. It's got 53 species and 325 reactions. So this is a direct numerical simulation of that. We are showing con uh, contours of temperature and OH. And this is a rank six uh, approximation of this. So instead of solving for 53 species, we are solving for six effective species. And, 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 and so we have um, uh, done more error analysis here. I, I just, and all those results are, are in this um, paper that hopefully will be out soon. Uh, but I want to show you that, like I said, for, for practitioners, these are, this is not just a way to speed up computation. This is actually interpretable. So if you focus on the Y modes here, the Y modes uh, represent uh, as a time dependent surface space in the comp in the thermal in the composition space, right? So if you look at the composition space, it's a 53 dimensional space. And each of these vectors is, is a, so this collectively is, is a subspace and I can visualize that subspace. And also we have done instantaneous PCA, that means instantaneous SVD of this matrix. And we show that this time dependent basis actually uh, closely follow uh, the, the, um, the, the instantaneous PCE. PCA, but there is also PCA that is done in combustion community. Unfortunately, I don't have to cover that, but that's really equivalent to like a POD approach, but for composition space. So that's a st static. You can see uh, that uh, the, especially the higher modes vary in time a lot. And you can look at the singular value, the singular values of that matrix. So we solve the DNS of that and we, we computed the singular values of that and then we can see the singular values with this low rank approximation, we can capture the leading modes very well. And these are, um, so I wanna go over this just in interest of time, but if you're interested in this, uh, we have um, a lot more details in, in, in this uh, uh, manuscript. And so we have extended this to three dimensional simulation as well. This is for a different mechanism, Syngas mechanism, it's similar. And you can see the modes, the, now the modes here are three dimensional modes. And this is a DNS, uh, mixture fraction of DNS, but these are the modes. One, the first mode, the second mode, third mode, you can see the modes actually evolve with the flow and they adapt uh, to the flow. This is another case done in Dr. Jackie Chen's group. 
um, and, 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 and so this actually has a sudden transition at the end. So there's a propagation of this wave from right to left. And then when it gets near the end, you will see a sudden transition in the chemistry. And so all the, this has 39 species uh, and this is solved in S3D code with eight order fine difference and all these details are here. Let me just show you uh, this problem is actually very high rank even this one. So we had to choose R equals to 29. So we are not really getting so much reduction here. And this is actually, I want to show you this as, as one of the challenges of solving these systems. Uh, that this instantaneously is not that low rank, but still you go from 39 to 29. And you, you can see this, uh, we can get the transport, but there's this sudden transition at the end that this kind of time dependent basis can capture that sudden transition. And if you look at, and also this is a convection dominated problem. So this kind of reduced or mulling handles convection really well, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And if you look at the, the, the composition of a space, you see it, you will see at the end, these two modes drastically change in time. Uh, the higher modes usually change in, in time in, uh, in all the cases that we have considered, but not the first two modes. And you can see at the end, once this animation approaches the end, these are the two most energetic modes. And you can see that that composition changes drastically towards the end, uh, as you saw here. Uh, so, uh, this, this is actually an extremely challenging problem to solve. All right, now I want to get to the COR decomposition. This was really an introduction to this. I want to talk about some of the other challenges, and especially how to solve this system of equation efficiently for for nonlinear govern for nonlinear PDEs. Right. So if you look at the evolution equation, this is this is this is this evolution equation I showed in the previous slide, but just simplified in terms of linear algebra. Right, so you solve an evolution equation for, for modes U and sigma and Y, but, but if the right-hand side of the governing equation is nonlinear, and so this is the right-hand side of the governing equation, you have to compute this F, which is a nonlinear map of your governing equation. If you form this matrix, first of all, you lose all the advantages that this methodology has to offer because you have to occupy the entire memory and then apply this nonlinear map on that decompressed matrix. Even though when we come back here, we project it back to this subspace, but this is the same problem that exists in nonlinear reduced or modeling with POD. Also, we have the same issue, and this it is exactly the same issue that shows up here. So you have you need to do some sort of hyper reduction here, and I want to show you that COR is actually the way to do hyper reduction here for this matrix differential equation. And uh, so there are four issues with this. There's, Issue of cost, which is the one we are uh, um, targeting here. And also, if you want to get efficiency with solving this equation, if your governing equation is nonlinear, like a combustion problem or a UQ problem, um, if it is quadratic nonlinearity, you can get a speed up solving this equation by just plugging in this expansion into the governing equation and work out in a painstaking way the, all the terms and, and, and solve this evolution equation, but that's highly intrusive. So you can get efficiency for nonlinear equation, but at the cost of doing an extremely intrusive process. Those two, these two are really the major drawbacks of this kind of formulation. And so we wanted to see if we can actually go back and, and, and be able to solve this system of equation for a generic nonlinearity, but keeping the cost the, uh, uh, as low as solving just for only R samples of this equation, right? So R samples, R is the rank of the reduction. That is the nominal cost of solving this equation. And also rank adaptivity and also stability when there are two other issues with this system. So first of all, R doesn't have to be fixed, right? So the rank of a system evolves over time. So just fixing that, that's a problem. So these problems actually uh, have been, um, this issue of inverting this matrix have been addressed in this beautiful work uh, uh, by reformulating this problem uh, to another problem uh, and actually resolving this issue of having very, uh, uh, ha having to invert this matrix. This matrix could become ill-conditioned. Remember, this is a singular value matrix. And if you want to solve this system with uh, high accuracy, you need to resolve very small singular values. And and so this is uh, 
so you so you have to be able to invert this matrix this uh, uh, integration scheme actually resolves that issue but the cost of uh, triple the cost of solving this uh, the scheme proposed here is triple of the cost of three times as large as the cost of solving this system but it doesn't have this issue rank adaptivity also has been proposed here with uh, work of daniela venturi for tensor evolution equation and also within this formulation but not the issue of cost so these two issues have not been addressed up to this point and that's really I feel like these are major uh, bottlenecks of solving this equation and getting the scale that uh, they can offer. Okay, so let me just go to, so the, all the details here uh, is in this paper that was recently published by myself and my, my student, uh, Hossein Naderi. Uh, so let me just give you an overview. So here I'm, I'm switching to a UQ problem. That's another application where you actually, a UQ problem, you can formulate it as a matrix differential equation here, but all the samples are, uh, so if you look at a UQ problem, you have a nonlinear um, differential equation and you have some random parameters. Uh, and so this is the matrix of, of all the samples where each column is one sample and you wanna do a low rank approximation of this matrix. Like I said, computing this F of V is as costly as solving the full order model. So that's the thing you, we want to avoid. For generic nonlinearity, if the system is linear, like I, the examples I showed at the beginning, you can actually work it out and solve this system in the compressed form, you, and you can actually achieve all the computational efficiency. But not if this system is nonlinear. And so, the cost of this system, if you don't handle this properly, will scale with the number of rows and number of columns of this matrix, and that exactly the cost that you want to avoid. You want to have this cost. So. Um, like I said, for linear quadratic system, you can do that at the cost of doing a highly intrusive process. So the question is that how can we reduce the computational cost of solving a rank R TDB ROM, time dependent basis ROM, to that of solving only to R samples of that full or more? That is the nominal cost of evolving these equations. So uh, this is, a, 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 so the, I want to uh, explain COR, which is a really fantastic, uh, and I, I, I believe, uh, underexplored uh, uh, linear algebra decomposition. <laughs> so this is, let me just explain that. So let's say you have a matrix G and this matrix has low rank structure, right? So this, you can approximate it. Like if you take SVD of this matrix with rank R, you can approximate it well. You can actually get a, something super close to an SVD of this matrix by strategically sample the columns and rows of this matrix, all the blue ones and all the, all the, red ones. And then you can approximate this matrix. This should be an approximation by just the columns of this, which are shown by blue color, and the rows of this matrix, which are shown by red, and this matrix, which is the, the intersection of these inverted. And this, if you uh, select these rows and columns strategically, you can get something very close to an SVD. And this was shown by Sorensen and Embry, uh, that this is dime-induced COR decomposition. All right, and so we adopted uh, the same strategy here. Uh, in fact, we didn't know about this, I have to confess, and we derived, we developed this methodology, and later on, we showed that actually this is exactly COR decomposition. Uh, so instead of F of T, is the right-hand side of the uh, governing equation. So we can, we only sample that equation at these columns and rows, not that. So anything you see here in gray, that is not computed. And based on that, we can compute this. Uh, you can also do a triple or, 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 or by the composition of this matrix. So we compute this uh, by, by sampling the columns, we find the column space for, uh, we orthonormalize that when we, uh, we, we, uh, we denote that by phi of t. This is really QR of the columns that we sampled. And then these are just the interpolation coefficient that you can get it by the by interpolating every other column of this matrix to these spaces. So this is an interpolate matrix interpolation, not a matrix projection, not a matrix projection. And that is very important. So there is really nice. Re, re, uh, this is actually an oblique projection rather than an orthogonal projection. So like I, I, unfortunately, I don't have time to cover all of that. But the key is that. Remember, we didn't want to compute this matrix entirely. We wanted to compute it only, that, that was the cost, right? So, but if, but this matrix does have low rank structure. Uh, if it didn't have low rank structure, we wouldn't be able to do this time dependent basis to begin with. And, and so if it has low rank structure, you can actually 
strategically sampled. This, uh, the sampling strategy is based on direct empirical interpolation method. I'm not going to go over this. All of those details are in the paper, how we do this. So we need to have SVD of the, this matrix to know where to sample. We don't have this matrix to begin with, let alone the SVD of this. We use the previous time step, uh, SVD of the previous time step of this matrix, which we have it cheaply, and use those as, 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 uh, to drive, to tell us where to sample. Right, so that's, and I don't want to go over all of this, but it, all the details are in that paper. Um, uh, and, and so this is really an overview of, of this strategy. Like I say, instead of F, the key is that instead of F, now we have two skinny matrices that we can plug in here. So instead of putting F here, remember F was the source of all the, all the ish computational issues. Now we have a skinny factorization that is plugged in here. Once you plug that in here, these are extremely fast then, I mean. And also, it's really nice that this is actually relatively non-intrusive because you only so solve the full order model, you sample the full order model and the right-hand side at these strategic columns, and you only need to sample it at these grid points. These are different grid points. So this, act, you don't need to derive a new set of equations for any new PDE you solve. You can actually just use, use these. In fact, there is a way to extend this to even black box solver and, and we are working on that. And to make this actually non-intrusive because these systems um, up to this point are were so extremely intrusive to, to solve. It takes a few months of, of time to just implement it in a, in, 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 in a typical final element code. And, and so, oh, Sorry, Hassan. Hassan, um, the previous slide. So those, the samples are dependent on time. So every time steps, it, exactly, those samples are changing. That's right. Exactly. Because these are uh, without with a fixed sample, you wouldn't be able to do this. Uh, and I'll show you in the, in the demonstration that exactly. That's that's exactly right. It is an implementation of that. It's kind of interesting. No. Well. You need to have access to the F right hand side, right? So, yeah. uh, right hand side, you can get it for sampling the full or more, but the rows are rows are intrusive <laughs> because rows you actually need to know the terms of the equation. So, that's the part yeah. you need to know all the terms in the governing equation. And, and that's changing every time step. So, that's right. Uh, these rows and columns change every time instant. It'll look at this SVD and approximation of SVD of the previous time step of F, and based on that, it'll update this. Yes. And this, this kind of approximation, like I said, is quite rigorous, actually. So instead of approximating, basically we're approximating the entire matrix of F with an F hat, which is the COR decomposition, which is this, uh, approx uh, this uh, multiplication of these two skinny matrices. You can show actually the difference between the full matrix and this approximation in the second norm is, so sigma P1, if we were doing SVD here, this error would be exactly equal to sigma P plus one. This would be the P plus one, a singular value. Here, we only get this uh, scaling of, of these two numbers. So uh, times the optimal error that you can get with a rank, up, uh, rank or approximation. And dime procedure, and these are the condition number of the interpolation matrices. And dime procedure, in fact, is a greedy procedure to minimize these two numbers. So you get really small numbers for these two. So you get, that's what I said, you get actually something similar to an SVD. That's, that's what I mean, but without actually forming that matrix at all. And, and you can form, and you can make this number of sample points also adaptive because uh, you can look at the last singular value that you're resolving, so divided, you can come up with different uh, error, error criteria. Well, you can look at the last singular value to, so divided by the summation of the resolved singular value. And if that's, not within the bound that you want. You can add, you can sample F uh, at one more columns and one more rows. So let me show you some application uh, to UQ. So this is a stochastic Berger's equation. The randomness comes from the initial condition and the boundary condition. And we're using a spectral element to solve this equation. Uh, and so you can see here the singular values. Let me show you that because in the interest of time, I want to show you the, the speed up actually you get, and then I'll show you some of the error. So this is TDB ROM. This is if you don't use this kind of methodology, uh, this is how the CPU time scales as you increase the number of grid points. So N is the number of grid points, the number of rows, but this one actually scales linearly. And uh, so, and also this is as you increase the number of samples. So it's the number of scales linearly again here. 
but and and uh, young so when you ask the, the the dime points are time dependent and that's exactly the case so we can use dime or q dime which is based on qr decomposition and this is berger's uh with the sh with shock so you see the sh two shocks here and you can see here that actually the dime points are changing with time this axis is time this is just i'm just showing the row points right so i'm, I, I'm not showing the columns because there's a sparse sampling in the column as well and you can see the q dime and dime actually capture almost the same points uh, so it, one one immediate way you can see the advantage of this if you go to the full or like the way we were doing these things before we were actually computing the right hand side at all of these grid points right now we are only computing the right hand side at these points so that's just that just tells you one uh, one quick way to to see how, how efficient this is and here we are comparing the modes that we extract by doing this kind of approximation with Carhun and Love approximation of the full or more which is the optimal base instantaneous basis. And you can see we have shock and we are capturing the full model really well. Um, this is another example. Berger's equation has quadratic nonlinearity. Maybe you were able to do, you can do that intrusively and still get efficiency, but not even even you do it intrusively, you're not gonna be as efficient as this methodology. But here, this is a compressible flow where the nonlinearity is non-polynomial. So you have actually rho u divided by rho. So you have nonlinearity of fractional nonlinearity. And if we discretize this system, we have 262,000 rows, and then we have 200,000 samples. So this is the case, if you wanna do uq here, you can even store this matrix in memory. Like uh, uh, we, we, we solve this on, on CPU, and the laptop CPU. So you can't even store this on the laptop CPU. So uh, we never actually during the workflow, we never store the full matrix. Uh, and we only do this as part sampling. And you can uh, here, first we did it for a small number of samples so we can actually do error analysis. So we did here for 200 samples and we show with this sparse sampling, we recover. So this is the TDB ROM. If you don't do a sparse sampling, the blue line, but this is TDP ROM with six sparse samples, 20 and 20 sparse samples. This is for dime and Q dime. And you see with 20 samples, you can actually recover almost the ones that you don't do the sparse sampling. And like I said, P is adaptive. So P changes in time. So how many, how many samples you have for the right hand side, you can actually adaptively adjust that to keep the error of the COR approximation below a, a given threshold. And you can see as time goes, uh, on that actually get different numbers of, of P. So these are number of samples. This is actually when you say time dependent. So this is actually, th this is the mean and the variance. And you can see the sample points actually captures the action here where the action happens. And, and like I said, this is now with 200,000 samples. And these are the samples in the column space, which you can see actually they are located on the joint PDF of, of Y1 and Y2. And we did convergence study here by increasing number of dime points. And you can see we, we are converging in the instantaneous singular values by increasing the rank of the system. We are still converging by increasing the number of samples from 100,000 to 100,000 and, and we get convergence. All of this is also in that paper. All right, I think I'm almost out of time. <laughs> I'm already out of time. So let me just conclude here. Uh, this is a, a, the way I, I see this, this field uh, and the contribution that this kind of reduced or modeling can do. So if you look at the way we, were, we are doing classical scientific computing, we do separation of variables, we put time and the coefficient and we choose the basis, right? So you've got these bases that you can choose from that library. I think another way of solving this equation, which is a structure resolving, you don't actually discretize the grid, you actually capture the linear and nonlinear correlation is by doing physics informed neural network. I know Paris is online. Uh, and basically, you don't. one way to look at a, a physics informed neural network is that you're not choosing the basis, you let the optimization process to find the optimal basis for you, right? So, there, so that is another way to break the curse of dimensionality and applying this to high dimensional problem. That's why it's advantageous. This is also another way of doing that, uh, but here we don't solve an, a nonlinear optimization problem, right? Uh, but uh, like I said, this has also its own limitation, but, uh, but you don't choose the basis again from a library, you let it evolve with time. And you, the, the physics of your equation and the residual of the governing equation really determines that. So here we apply this 
to 2D problem here. This is compressible Navier Stokes. And you can see the basis actually evolves. These are bases in the one, X2 direction, these are bases in the X1 direction. And you see bases adaptively evolve in time. I mean, for this kind of problem, it's not really important to use these bases, but for high dimensional problem, this localization and adaptivity of the bases is really the key to break the curse of dimensionality. Because you don't want to put degrees of freedom in, in places, especially in high dimensional spaces. You don't want to waste degrees of freedom. And so this can actually effectively do that. And we have applied this to tensor evolution equations as well, uh, which I uh, didn't have time to cover that today, uh, maybe some other time. Yeah, and so this is where I see the place of this. So it's actually, it's got good connections with classical computing and also with machine learning in, in, in a way because this is a low rank approximation. All right, so I'll, with that, I'll uh, thank you and I'll take any questions. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Hassan, uh, for the wonderful, play. very interesting. Um, thank you. Okay, so let's have a Q&A session. So we do have a question from Pat. Pat, uh, are you online? You... Yes. Hey. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you ask questions directly? Thank you. Those were I, I really liked the 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 images and stuff. It, I, I think they they really helped. But I, but I did have trouble understanding what the what the reduced set of dimensions uh, corresponded to. What are they What are they representing? Are yep. they for in the in the chemical example? For example, are, uh, you talked about having lots of species. The new, uh, the new basis. Does each one correspond to an algebraic combination of the original species, or is it something else? Entirely? That's right. So every one of those. Let me go back to that example. That's exactly right. I think you said it at the end. Uh, that. So if you look at this matrix as the matrix of of the, all the species, we don't solve for these directly. We solve for these modes. Each of these modes are really a linear combination of all of the species. Okay. This and is it's, yeah. And it's, always, and it's always linear. It is always linear, but you can actually extend this to uh, nonlinear answers as well, and cool. that's actually what we're working. And and that is actually, I think, the next really frontier. So, so so there might be cases where some of the species are effectively have have no influence at all, but and there's others where where it's really a, a mixture of them. But my guess is there's certain kinds of things that go on there, like you would probably never have. Um, my guess is that there would be the species would be clustered or something, right? I don't know if that's true, but I can imagine that being true. Absolutely, and that's exactly right. So that's so what you're talking about is actually this uh, maybe not one global time dependent basis, but you can actually localize that either in the composition space or in the physical space, and have and absolutely. So we are actually exactly working on, on that idea as well. Uh, and 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 we see actually amazing improvement compared to just okay. using one, oh, one I, global. I, I, I believe that I believe it speeds things up. I just want to understand what's going on. So these are like the species are like gang members. They hang out together. Exactly. And they travel the same together and 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 so on. Okay, got it. Thank you. Of course. Great. Then I had a second question about the CUR work, which yep. seems very different. So. So, in one example, you showed the, some of the points, and it looked like those were the points that had a sort of the extreme values. Was that? Is that That's right. Doing? That's oh. right. So, let me show the Berger's equation exactly. So, I think so. What they actually these points correspond to? So, they actually concentrated over the shocks, right? So, there, there are two shocks here, right? So. And, and the DIME algorithm in right. a clever way actually picks out, so you don't need to sample this at all of the points here. You only need to sample it at, at, at these points, but this is usually where action happens, so right? When, so, I, when, I, when I turn on the weather channel and someone tells me, well, there's a front moving through here. It's sort of like that. You can, you're, they're, they're trying to identify the, the interesting, the oh, discontinuities or, or, or major change kind of kind of areas in fact one thing you can immediately see if you look at the dime procedure if these are these are the two modes that are visualized these are often normal modes to each other and so the dime the first dime point if i want and the first the most important point is where this mode is has a maximum value mm -hmm. 
That's actually the first point, which is that is the if you want to pick one point in your system at that instant of time that has the most variance, that's this point here. So it picks that one and then it sort of recursively takes out this mode out of the system and see what's left mm -hmm. within the leftover. Then it starts uh, in an, a, a greedy way to pick out more points. And it does that. It's like a sort of a, like a QR type approximation. You layer by layer with each point, you pick out what's okay. so they are will be concentrated. So you see these modes are highly non-localized, highly localized, right? So they're very localized near the shock and in between they're sort of flat. So Dime doesn't actually pick those points, and it's a, it's a brilliant uh, methodology. Okay, thank you very much. Of course. Okay, next question is from Mariam. Uh, Mariam, are you online? Yeah, I am online. Okay, you can ask. Uh, actually, uh, what I'm thinking to how extent to what extent the method could be used, uh, it's come to my mind that what are the exact uh, conditions or requirement that the PD should have to can be yes. applicable. Excellent question. So re remember when I said at the beginning, these are uh, low rank approximation for matrix differential equation. Number one, you have to uh, formulate your problem as a matrix differential equation, one. And then second, you need to see if that matrix instantaneously has low rank. If your problem meets these two criteria, then this is a really good method uh, to use. If not, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> that's actually a topic of future research. Yeah. And uh, maybe it's out of context, but just let me know if uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, the method is, uh, is mainly developed for a time dependent PDs. If you have another type of PDs that uh, it's partial differential, but doesn't include the time. Do you think it's applicable to yep, that yep. piece? You can do that. Absolutely. You can do that for actually there are a lot of nice result, theoretical results for a steady state PDs. Mm -hmm. So yeah. first of all, this, this time iterations would become, this time evolution becomes iterations in, in that context. Exactly. And you can, you can take much larger leap and steps to convert mm -hmm. so you're not limited by the time so there are other algorithms that you can use to jump over that and then then you can show actually converge to the svd of that result so there are a lot of nice things you can show but yeah absolutely the you can apply this to steady state problems thank you well following on marian's questions you know if you don't have a time dependent terms then um, instead you have a 3d uh, this, your space your domain is 3D, then you can make them to matrix equations by decomposing each dimension into 1D, so, 2D, 3D. You, there are, I mean, even a one dimensional equation can be turned into a matrix differential equation. So it's really, that's actually where you have to be even, so a 3D problem can become a, in a number of ways can become a matrix differential equation, right? So you can take the 2D slab as one direction yeah. X1 and X2 and X3 is another direction, right? So yeah. that's, or you can even do this for a tensor evolution equation, which I didn't talk about, right? So that's another way. So if a 3D problem naturally fits within a tensor evolution equation and tensor evolution equation of this system is very similar to what I just presented. All the principles are the same and you can do, derive that. But like I said, there are a number of ways you can matricize. A so, so for example, if you have a 1D, example, no time dependence, how would you make a matrix uh, equation? Uh, you and can you have only one, one variable. You can do domain decomposition and put them next to each other. That's one way. I see. Interesting, interesting. Okay, <laughs> so um, uh, any other questions from audience? No, we actually hit the 11 o'clock, you know, punctually. <laughs> All right. Magically. Um, well, I'm, thank you so much, Hassan, for the wonderful talk. And sounds like you have more topics to talk about. Um, let's, you know, reserve that for the, the second. For the future, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, let's thank um, our invited speaker, Hassan, for the wonderful talk. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Yanks. Nice we appreciate the opportunity yeah. to present. Yeah, I learned a lot. And I, I, I promise you, I'm going to look into this in more <laughs> deeply.
<laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The stuff you do, actually, this is uh, very relevant. Very relevant. Yeah. Very relevant. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. All right. Um, Thank you so much. Hassan, if you can share the uh, the slide with me, that would be wonderful. Okay. Thank sure. You. Absolutely. You can do that. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Thank you, Hassan. All right. Thank, Thank you, everyone. you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.